This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that leaks the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, powering solutions that proactively protect over 2 billion employees and consumers worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. Tensions between Russia and Ukraine remain high as NATO offers Ukraine cyber, diplomatic and other support. North Korea gets DDoSed. Dazzle Spy hits Hong Kong dissidents drawn to a watering hole. TrickBot ups its game. A quick look at ransomware trends. Microsoft's Kevin McGee unpacks a recent World Economic Forum report. Our own Rick Howard speaks with Chris Nicely from MITRE Attack Defender on certifications. And Dame Fortune teaches Michiganders to throw caution to the winds. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, January 26th, 2022. Russian forces near the Ukrainian border, now estimated in media reports as having stabilized around a troop strength of 100,000, remain in position as NATO increases its own readiness in the region, although forward-deployed NATO troops number far less than the Russian forces on the other side. Ukraine has maintained its own forces in a state of alert, but Kiev has also, Military Times reports, sought to reassure the public that a Russian invasion, while a serious threat, is neither imminent nor inevitable. A high state of military readiness is nothing new for the country's eastern provinces, which have seen Russian-backed separatist activity since 2014. Fighting, as the AP reports, has continued at a sporadic low level. Ukrainian military capabilities aren't negligible, resembling as they do a somewhat smaller version of Russia's and an analysis in the Washington Post offers reason to expect that any large-scale combat would be both protracted and painful. The New Atlanticist has an overview of the current state of play in the Donbas region. Quote, Bolstering discussions about Donetsk and Luhansk independence may be aimed at putting additional pressures on Ukraine to make concessions to Russia. If Putin decides to recognize these regions as sovereign states— It would put an end to the 2014 and 2015 Minsk peace agreements in which Russia participated as a mediator between Ukrainian government authorities and the self-proclaimed republics. Recognition of the two breakaway regions could also lay the groundwork for Russia to deploy additional military troops there. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry estimates that there are currently 35,000 separatist fighters and 2,000 Russian regular forces in Donetsk and Luhansk, according to Reuters, though Russia disputes those tallies. Recognition of these territories would also trigger additional Western sanctions against Russia. President Putin has said that Ukraine's efforts to restore authority over the area resembles genocide, the New York Times reports, and for all the Russian media attempts to characterize Ukraine as moving toward Nazism, They have convinced few abroad, but they're likely to remain a staple of Moscow's influence campaign. The crisis, as Moscow says it sees it, has been made in Washington and Brussels, where a mixture of calculation and hysteria have convinced Western governments that Russia is a threat to Ukraine. Russian television news outlets have been particularly active in distributing this particular line, Reuters reports. A correspondent for Vesti said in a representative interview, as far as any Russian threat to Ukraine is concerned, quote, they've invented it. The Americans have been scaring themselves about a Russian invasion for months, end quote. In the present phase of the conflict, deniable gray zone cyber operations are generally regarded as likely. 
NATO has reaffirmed what it characterizes as its long-standing commitment to Ukrainian cyber defense. A statement from the alliance said, quote, NATO has been working with Ukraine for years to increase its cyber defenses and will continue to do so at pace, end quote. The same statement also quoted Deputy Secretary General Mircha Joanna on the current crisis in NATO's eastern flank, quote, the use of hybrid attacks against Ukraine, including cyber attacks and disinformation, as well as the massing of advanced weapons on its borders, underlines the key role of advanced technology in modern warfare. End quote. The Deputy Secretary General, delivering a keynote yesterday at CyberSec Global 2022, described the situation with respect to Ukraine as grave and called upon Russia to return to negotiations with the Atlantic Alliance. Of course, uh, we are all very much focused on the tensions created by Russia in and around Ukraine. And Russia, with neither provocation nor necessity, has massed over 100,000 troops and advanced weapons to the borders uh, of Ukraine. Although we do not know for sure the intentions of the leadership in Moscow, the potential of invasion in the coming days and weeks is real. At the meeting of the NATO-Russia Council on uh, January Uh, 12th, all allies spoke with a single voice. They called on Russia to immediately de-escalate the situation and to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of its neighbors. They called on Russia to end its aggressive posturing and to stop its malign activities aimed at allies and partners. And the Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, has proposed further meetings with Russia and there are many concrete areas where we can make progress and we are interested here to give diplomacy a chance. He emphasized NATO's willingness to seek a diplomatic solution to a crisis he described as being of Russia's own making, but also said that any acceptable solution would have to be consistent with NATO's core principles. NATO and NATO allies are ready to engage and listen to Russia's concerns, but will not compromise on core principles, on the right of each nation to choose its own path, and on NATO's ability to protect and defend all allies. Finally, he described NATO's response to the recent cyber attacks against Ukrainian government resources. We've seen uh, the massive uh, cyber attacks against uh, Ukrainian public institutions. It is for the Ukrainian authorities to investigate and attribute what happened, but we all wholeheartedly condemn this attack on the Ukrainian government. The morning of the attack... NATO cyber experts in Brussels were immediately in touch with their Ukrainian counterparts, exchanging information and offering their assistance. Allied experts in country are also supporting the Ukrainian authorities on the ground. NATO has been working with Ukraine for years to increase its cyber defenses, and we will continue to do so at pace. These clips are all from NATO's website. The cyber attack against Global Affairs Canada remains under investigation, the CBC reports. Ottawa has said the incident was contained and that while services haven't been fully restored, no other government agencies or services were affected. The government hasn't said much about the nature of the incident, nor has it offered any attribution. An official statement said, quote, There is no indication that any other government departments have been impacted by this incident, This investigation is ongoing. We are unable to comment further on any specific details for operational reasons. The timing of the incident, coming as it did as Canadian security services were warning of the possibility of Russian cyber attacks during the crisis over Ukraine, prompted much informed speculation to the effect that Russian organs were responsible, and CBC has an extensive summary of the reasons for thinking so. But, that said, attribution remains unclear, and coincidence remains a real possibility. The U.S. has devoted considerable attention to the sanctions it might bring against Russia should Moscow carry out its threat against Ukraine. Some of those resemble the U.S. measures against Huawei, but writ large, and are designed to cover broad stretches of the Russian economy as opposed to one or a handful of companies. The U.S. is also considering, according to Bloomberg, sanctions directed specifically against Russian President Vladimir Putin. A recent example of what such sanctions might look like is afforded by last week's U.S. Treasury Department action against four Ukrainian nationals accused of working as Russian agents of influence against the government in Kiev. 
Elsewhere in the world, Reuters reports that North Korea's already closely controlled and tightly limited internet has been disrupted by a significant distributed denial-of-service incident for the second time in two weeks. Little information, still less any attribution, is available, but Reuters notes that the timing of the outages may be significant. They've occurred around Pyongyang's recent tests of long-range missiles. Security firm ESET has found that the compromised website of a pro-democracy, which is to say objectively anti-Beijing, radio station in Hong Kong, has been serving as a watering hole. Visitors to the site are served a WebKit exploit, Dazzle Spy, that's designed for use against macOS systems. It's not the first time such activity has been observed. Google's threat analysis group described watering hole activity back in November, and Sequoia.io researchers tweeted at about the same time that an inauthentic site catering to dissidents in Hong Kong had been designed from the outset with that purpose in mind. Which threat actor specifically is behind the campaigns, he said isn't yet prepared to conclude, but it does say that, quote, given the complexity of the exploits used in this campaign, we assess that the group behind this operation has strong technical capabilities, end quote. TrickBot, malware traded in criminal-to-criminal markets and used in a wide range of cybercrime, especially bank fraud, has received an upgrade that renders it more resistant to analysis, bleeping computer reports. IBM trustee researchers report rising rates of infestation and effective man-in-the-browser injections. Ivanti today released the results of its ransomware spotlight year-end report, an overview of trends in ransomware the security firm observed over the course of 2021. The company found 32 new ransomware families in 2021, which brings the total they're tracking to 157. That represents a 26% increase over 2020. Unpatched vulnerabilities continue to offer the criminals their principal entree, but the gangs also showed an ability to find and exploit zero days. The criminals took a greater interest in the software supply chains during 2021, and of course the C2C market continues to mature, with ransomware-as-a-service mimicking the growth of the legitimate software-as-a-service market. And finally, hey, you've won the lottery, says an email. Yeah, yeah, sure, you say, and you think, ha, tell it to my great-aunt, the widow of Prince Mokele Mobembe, because you weren't born like yesterday, and you bong that email over to the bozo list. But wait, no, really, you actually did win the lottery. That was the recent experience of a woman in Oakland County, Michigan, U.S. of A. The Michigan Lottery explains that one lottery player, we redact her name and age to preserve her privacy, matched the five white balls, 02, 05, 30, 46, 61, in the December 31st, 2021 drawing to win a $1 million prize. And how about this? Because she bought her winning ticket online at michiganlottery.com, the Mega Plier, we're not sure what that is, but it sounds pretty good. The Mega Plier, we say, automatically jumped her prize up threefold to a cool three million U.S. dollars. It gets better. She found the email in her spam folder, where, in truth, any one of us would have sent it. So there you go. Sometimes it seems too good to be true, except, in fact, it turns out to be true. So congratulations to the newest millionaire in Oakland County, but please don't use her experience as an excuse to let your guard down. We hate it when Lady Luck teaches bad lessons. And now a word from our sponsor, Recorded Future. Staying one step ahead of the rapidly evolving threat landscape requires a constant flow of daily intelligence. To stay up to date on everything happening in the world of cybersecurity, join over 50,000 other security professionals who subscribe to the Cyber Daily. With daily email updates on the latest cybersecurity news, top threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, suspicious IP addresses, and more, the Cyber Daily is the first thing security professionals check every morning. To learn more and subscribe for free, go to recordedfuture.com slash cyber dash daily. And we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show.
Our own Rick Howard recently spoke with Chris Nicely from MITRE Attack Defender for the latest on their Ingenuity Curriculum Certifications. Rick Howard files this report. I'm joined by Chris Nicely. He's the general manager for the MITRE Attack Defender program. Chris, welcome to the show. For our listeners who don't know, can you walk us through just exactly what is the MITRE Attack Defender program? As you may be aware, MITRE developed the MITRE ATT&CK framework a few years back and uh, yep. really provides that common adversary behavior language across vendors and tools and different teams within an organization. Looking at how that was being used across the industry about a year and a half ago and really saw a gap in the skills of people actually being able to employ it in practical ways. I really wanted to change that. So we launched MITRE ATT&CK Defender, uh, MAD, as a training and certification platform to try to change the game and how people were using attack and threat and form defense. So I agree with you that the minor attack framework really hasn't been operationalized by most network defenders out there. And I'm always aghast at why I think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But your program, the certification program you have with MAD, is going to help people learn about it so they can deploy it better? Yeah, that's exactly it. We saw this gap of people not using it the way the attack team thought it could be used. And then we also were looking at one of the challenges that we saw just looking at the cyber landscape was the skills gap that everybody talks about, right, is massive in this, just trying to fill it and then find ways to validate skills. I talked to tons of CISOs or organizations on a regular basis and almost to a T, every single one of them says, the certifications that are out there suck. The fact that I got a certification five years ago and it's still valid doesn't tell me anything. And at best, when I got it, I memorized a book and I was able to just go and, you know, sit down for a four-hour exam and and write down what I memorized and pass the exam. So we wanted to change those two things along with providing the attack knowledge. So what makes uh, the MAD program, the MITRE Attack Defender program, different? What are you guys trying to do to change all that? The first is all of the training is free. Wow. So just come and sign up for a MAD account and you can access, I forget the total number, but it's uh, somewhere over 60 videos now. They're all designed to be bite size, so you can fit them in during the day across attack fundamentals, attack cyber threat intelligence, and attack SOC assessments. So that's what we've got today. And actually, probably by the time your listeners hear this, will have launched attack adversary emulation, the first uh, set of modules there as well. This is a fantastic resource. Let me just restate the wow factor here. The training for the MITRE ATT&CK framework called the MITRE ATT&CK Defender Program, or MAD for short, spelled M-A-D, the how-to instructions to make the ATT&CK framework work for your organization is completely free. That's amazing. Now, MITRE Ingenuity, the commercial arm for MITRE, has to make money somewhere, so they charge for certifications, and I think that's totally fair. Do the training for free, and if you want to be a certified MAD, pay for the badge. We should all be taking advantage of this program. And I want to thank Chris Nicely, the general manager for the MAD program, for coming on the show and explaining it to us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Sock OS. Support for this show and for stretched security teams comes from Sock OS. Too many security alerts means alert fatigue for under-resourced SecOps teams. The traditional tools aren't solving the problem and come with their own overheads. Sock OS is the lightweight, cost-effective, and low-maintenance solution for your team. Centralize, enrich, and correlate your security alerts into manageable, prioritized clusters. Get started and sort the signal from the noise with an extended free trial by visiting SockOS.io slash CyberWire. And we thank SockOS for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Kevin McGee. He is the Chief Security Officer at Microsoft Canada. Uh, Kevin, it's always great to have you back on the show. 
You know, I, I saw a recent report come out from the World Economic Forum, and uh, it struck me that among the, the sort of economic news that they put out there when it comes to the global economy uh, does not exist in a vacuum. And that affects those of us who are fighting the good fight in cybersecurity every day. I wanted to check in with you for your insights on, on that specific notion. Well, David, you know I love a good report, and as a chief security officer, the Global Risk Report is is uh, is a real page turner for me. Uh, it comes in 117 pages, so it's not a light read, but. I like to read it as a cybersecurity professional, and I think we need to do this. Step back and see what's coming. See what the uh, the global perspective is, what the geopolitical risks are, what the social economical changes are, what environmental risks are really weighing on us uh, as as humans and as a global community, and then start to translate to that in, down the future. What will be the consequences that I will need to think about and prepare for as a security professional and a chief security officer? Again, you know, even climate change can have uh, effects on on cybersecurity in ways that we don't even conceive about until we start to really think through the ramifications of uh, power lines being cut or natural disasters taking out data centers and whatnot. We do that in disaster recovery, but there are security ramifications as well, too, if we start to think that way. Can we go through some, some examples of, of the things that catch your eye in a report like this? Yeah, what I found interesting in this year's report is really this this theme of divergence. You know, there are nations that are are becoming fully vaccinated, some that are not, some that have accelerated digital transformation, some that are not. Um, social uh, and economical divergence uh, that the pandemic has, has, um, has really brought about. So we're, we're seeing these divides and these, div- uh, these divides becoming even wider, which the best way to find vulnerabilities if you're an attacker is to look for a place to put a wedge in and either create disinformation campaigns if it's a nation state actor or uh, find uh, social economical uh, challenges to uh, to leverage as well too. Um, so these are the type of things we need to look at as security professionals to think of how are the cyber criminals, how are the nation state actors going to respond? Because often we see real time responses to things that are happening in the news and and threat actors taking advantage of what happens in the news. So the more we can look down to what's coming in the future, the better we can start to prepare for ourselves and our organizations to protect against these these challenges. How do you take a report like that and turn it into proactive actions? I think one of the, the best things is to do thought experiments. And uh, one of the areas that it, uh, the report really looks at is space and what's going on in space now. We're seeing commercial satellites launch. We're seeing a lot more friction. We're seeing a lot of turf wars beginning to happen in space. What re- ramifications will have that on my organization? When I was talking to a financial services uh, company, uh, they felt it, you know the satellites were taken out. There was no effect to their business. But it turned out a good portion of their ATM fleet was actually managed by satellites. So there are ramifications uh, and security problems that can, uh, can come out of some of these areas. So thought exercises of, you know, what could happen um, down the line and then teasing out what, what effect would that have on my organization. And you start to find new vulnerabilities that would have never occurred to you uh, as, as uh, in the past. And as we rely more and more on technology and, and our countries are ones that have really di- accelerated digital transformation, we're going to, to do, we need to do much more of this because these vulnerabilities will hit us faster and more often and uh, in from sectors or areas of technology or the globe where we never really thought there could be uh, cybersecurity challenges before. So again, thought exercises, stepping back, not focusing on the individual uh, attack vectors and whatnot, which we like to do the technology, but getting to the layer eight level of security and really understanding what's driving some of these tensions. What, you know, what are what are the opportunities being created by cyber crim- uh, for cyber criminals or nation states to exploit? And then what, what does that look like six months out, 18 months out, three years out? And how can I start to prepare now to, uh, to start to close some of these gaps? Well, Kevin McGee, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Arctic Wolf. End cyber risk for your organization with the Arctic Wolf Security Operations Cloud and Concierge Security Model. Learn more at arcticwolf.com slash cyberwire. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. 
The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karf, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a word from our sponsor, Trellix. Today, there's a new way to look at security, not just as a cause for concern, but as an opportunity to better your business. With a living security solution from Trellix, you can face your future with confidence, knowing that every day you're getting smarter and more agile. Threats are evolving, but so is your company. When you have a platform that's always learning and adapting, you can stay one step ahead of the threats. Incidents are on the rise, but your organization can rise above them. By tapping into open partnerships and native connections, you can respond to incidents in real time. Risk management is growing more complex, but your business has what it takes to overcome complexity. With embedded tools and expert insights, you can make risk management easy. Bring your security to life with Trellix. And we thank Trellix for sponsoring our show.